All right. Hey, Ben, how are you doing? Welcome to the show on the uh, episodes that I do, which is what I've been calling it lately. Thanks for having me. So uh, you've had quite the interesting past few weeks, as I've seen. Uh, you, uh, Well, you haven't been feeling the best, I hear, and uh, also had some interesting debates and fallout from that. Yeah, yeah. I have... Um... I, I don't actually know that James O'Keefe gave me COVID, but I choose to believe it. Uh, yeah, so uh, to put those those two things you just referred to together. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I had, let's see, so I guess this is about a week and a half ago at this point. Um, I was uh, in New York for the weekend, and on the Sunday of that weekend, I was in Brooklyn for Norbert Finkelstein's book launch. But the day before on Saturday, I was at the Beacon Theater, which is a like Broadway theater, uh, for a debate uh, with um, uh, Tim Poole, James O'Keefe, and Tulsi Gabbard. Which I remember I I told a uh, I had a call a couple days earlier with a uh, editor I work with, the Jacobin, and I told her that you know what I was going to New York to do. And she told me that it sounded like I was describing a dream, right. You know, the, the layout of people on the, uh, on the stage there. Yeah. No kidding. Um, as like a Tulsi Gabbard was there for some reason. And that was right. So, um, so yeah, it was, it was a, it was a super, it was a super strange event in, you know, many different ways. So I'd never even heard of, uh, James O'Keefe actually. And I tuned in cause I thought it'd be interesting to see what Tulsi Gabbard had to say, uh, which she wound up not saying a whole lot, but I did, uh, learn about a new scumbag who is James O'Keefe. And, uh, I think it's pretty, pretty clear from all the footage that's come out from the before, during and after of the event that this guy really was just out to, find some way to make you look bad and yeah uh, i don't want to go too far into that because i know it's sure so I'll, i will say um like i i can totally see how that guy could not be on your radar bef- before this um but uh you know i i do remember him from a very long time ago because um you know what he sort of originally came to prominence for was uh 2009 uh he um 2009 i think that's right uh so he had um james o'keefe uh you know had these did this series of videos that were like supposed to be exposés of something called uh acorn which is uh a um you know now defunct um uh sort of network of community organizations that would uh that would do things like uh try to get investment in underserved communities and you know lobby for you know lobby for uh for affordable housing and, and stuff like that uh, you know i'm sure it's a you know i don't know a ton about acorn seems to be a you know very mainstream liberal nonprofit. i'm sure we'd have our criticisms but uh but it doesn't seem like a you know horribly evil target you know on the uh, on the face of it, uh, but um, what what O'Keefe did and this woman Hannah Giles uh, famously back in uh, yeah this is you know a decade and change ago at this point uh, is that they went into a bunch of Acorn offices in different places uh, dressed as a pimp and a prostitute uh, like a like a pretty cartoonish idea of a pimp and a prostitute, I will say. Uh, and, uh, and, Oh, sorry. I lost your sound. Big feather in the hat and everything. <laughs> it was that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and basically you try to get like advice from acorn people about how to, you know, how to set up like a, you know, like a brothel, and, you know, like how to disguise it legally and stuff like that. And, uh, and, uh, in any case, there was there was a whole thing uh, at the time. They actually got Acorn uh, defunded, right? You know, lost the government funded as a result of this. But also, uh, both like states' attorney generals of multiple states said they'd reviewed the footage, and not only is nobody in Acorn guilty of a crime, but uh, they, um, but like they thought that the 
you know, the footage had been edited in a pretty wildly misleading way. You know, there were people who had called the cops on them. Uh, of course, they uh, they didn't they didn't include that. You know, in their in their video montage, there were points in the video where you see them walk in in the pimp and prostitute outfits, and then like they splice in like parts of conversation that suggest that. These were conversations that happened while they were in the office dressed like that, but they were actually in some other office where it came in in a suit and a tie. Uh, just, just crazy, you know, deceptive stuff like that. They ended up having to pay out a bunch of money, said uh, money, in uh, when um, you know to Acorn employees who'd uh, who'd sued them. Uh, so that's what, but that's the that's the initial incident that he uh, that uh, that O'Keefe um, kind of became famous over and it's and it's funny because uh defenders of of O'Keefe's organization project veritas will always say things like well they they've won every lawsuit for the last whatever number of years and they're just like you know they, they just want to leave out this uh this pretty massive entry and you know in that and it's not surprising right that they that they win lawsuits since then because it's really hard to prove um you know to prove defamation in American courts, uh, that's that's difficult. They're very careful about staying on, you know, on the right, you know, like just on the right side of the law. But that gives you a sense. And because I knew he was going to be on this debate stage, I had done a segment on my show, give them an argument a few days before about a different series of videos that you know Keith had done. This is like it's still within the it's after the Acorn stuff, but it's still within the early years of Project Veritas. Uh, which was a series of um, of uh, videos uh, targeting the uh, teachers unions of New Jersey. You can kind of tell how long ago it was from the cultural reference. It's uh, New Jersey teachers unions gone wild, and it's like structured as a like parody, like the you know, parody of those old you know girls gone wild like right. uh, commercials. And uh, they basically did two things in there, which were that they uh, took. Uh, they took hidden cameras into uh, into well New Jersey Teachers Convention. It was in the first and most sort of famous of these videos, and uh, and kind of took everything from you know people sort of casual drug use as exists in any convention ever, right? You know, I, I guarantee you CPAC, whatever you want to find, right? They'll, they'll all have that, uh, and. Um, and you know, people saying off-color things, and uh, and people expressing uncensored opinions about then Governor uh, Chris Christie, uh, Governor of New Jersey, then. Um, and then the other thing is they'd sort of they they take they would like pretend to be teachers in distress, talking to union officials, saying, "Well, if I'm accused of blah blah blah, right? Are you gonna you know would you like help me?" And you know they come up with some luridly bad thing, and they'd be like, "Yeah, of course," because it's like asking a lawyer, like, "If I'm accused of murder, you know, would you represent me?" It's like, "Yes, that's that that is my function. I'm a, that's that's what a that's what a lawyer does, right? Part of the thing that a uh, part of the thing that a that uh, that you know union officials do at a closed shop is that you know people have disciplinary problems. You know they they." They help through the process, which doesn't necessarily mean they can save your job in every, any given case, right? Depending on what you did and what kind of, you know, and um, you know whether it's the first time and et cetera, et cetera, right? You know, but I mean, like that is helping people with disciplinary and grievance procedures is you know is a major part of how you know how unions work in closed shop environments in American uh, in American workplaces, and it's a good thing. Uh, and this is the point that I made, and then. Uh, the um, and then there was this bizarre incident, you know, that you mentioned, where you know minutes before I'm supposed to go up on stage, at which point anything O'Keefe wanted to to say to me, he, you know, or anything he wanted to ask me, right? He could have asked in front of a Broadway theater full of people, you know. Right, it's, it's and, a, and he he basically looked like he just lost a really bad fight on stage the whole time. He he, uh, he was. I don't know if you picked up on this, but he looked to me like he was beat red and just didn't know what to do in response to your comments. And then Tim Pool was sort of trying to uh, soften the issue a little bit, and uh, he kind of just sat there. <laughs> yeah, Tulsi, to do with Tulsi was like practically not there. Like there was a there was like a at the very beginning of it. 
there's this kind of morning talk show softball question that was asked uh, to everybody and she sort of participated in that and there was a point where like they awkwardly changed the subject for like a couple minutes to air her complaints about media and that was almost it like i remember she um uh, i remember she tried to say something at one point about you know because of course the panel was was dominated by what had just happened with you know with, with james you know because because he um you know he kind of um essentially like had somebody lure me uh backstage into like the hallway where there are a bunch of people with cameras and you know a bunch of people crowded around and he could like do again is this very bizarre instance of ambush journalism because like minutes later there's this whole big theater with full of people uh I was going to be on stage, talked about whatever he wanted to talk about, right? He could have done it then, right? But then, then it wouldn't have been a Project Veritas video. It wouldn't have been a, like, candid, you know, uh, whatever. Like, so he couldn't have done it that way. So he, uh, you know, what he tries to to do is to say that in this, like, clip that we played from that first New Jersey Teachers Gone Wild uh, video, that like, oh, we weren't pay, playing the worst stuff. Um, the way he put it was absurd. It was like that we were doctoring it, which is like, well, I don't know. I mean, is any clip doctoring by definition if you just played a clip? Uh, right. You know, but it, it's uh, but what we did is we just played the first 54 seconds of a five-minute video unedited, uninterrupted. It was clear that that wasn't the whole video, right? It was just a clip like, like you'd play on a show. Uh, and what he really wanted to focus on was something that happens uh, 30 seconds after the uh, the part that we played, uh, and which was not at all the focus the rest of the video. It was actually only the remaining four minutes or so of the video. It, was only, it took up a grand total of 20 seconds of it where somebody uh, claims it's actually a little unclear, try to dig into this sense if there's even like a real underlying incident or, or it's just like a rumor that somebody was spreading over drinks at a, uh, at a convention, you know, but they, they claim yeah. that there was this teacher in uh, there was this New Jersey teacher who'd uh, who'd, who'd said the N word and they were, uh, and they, and there was some kind of disciplinary process, but they hadn't completely lost their job and um as oh why didn't you include that right that's so much worse right you know than, than what you did it's like well okay i actually don't think it is because i mean one i mean it's a rumor but two even if it's true okay uh i mean if somebody does something legitimately bad right like i still you know it's like i still want accused terrorists to you know like who, who are like trying to like blow up thousands of people to you know, get like trial by jury and, you know, and, and have parole boards and all that stuff. Right. Like I, I don't want them to just be shipped to Guantanamo Bay. I, I think if somebody does something bad in the workplace, right. Then, um, I still want there to be like due process before they're punished. I, I still want there to be somebody to represent their interests in that process. I think if a union does that, that's a good thing, right? You know, if 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 we have a society where it's it's harder to fire people and there's more due process and you know there's somebody you know like like even if you genuinely screw up and do something bad, you know that there's this uh, that there's like um, there's some kind of process to ensure that your rights are being respected. Maybe even that if it's the first time, you know, you get a second chance. Whatever. These all seem like good things to me, which was the you know which is the larger point that you know that. I would, make it in, in a strange sort of way i will say as unpleasant an experience as it was and as much as like you know the last uh <laughs> you know the last like week since that has been uh, a combination of having this like vast army of um bots and uh you know spreading it all over social media and, and this vast army of, of trolls you know sort of weighed in about it all the time and you know said did like yeah. it you know, and saying like, you know, saying weird anti-Semitic things and saying, you know, and, and, and just, and just being very like aggressive and weird about it. Um, you know, it's still, um, you know, so I don't love any of that, you know, but, uh, but I do, I will say in a strange sort of way, I think it's good because the main thing that I came to the debate wanting to, wanting to talk about, Right, because it's like okay, it's it's kind of a, you know, I have 
I have a zillion criticisms of Tim Pool and and you know and and I and I have some some very serious criticisms of Tulsi Gabbard, but you know you sort of have to pick your you know pick your battles. You sort of have to pick what you want to focus on. And the thing that I really wanted to focus on coming in was uh, James O'Keefe from Project Veritas's um, uh, anti-union stuff and the sort of what what strikes me as the as the kind of uh, giant contradiction between their opposition to teachers unions and particularly the fact that the complaint about teachers unions is that it makes it, you know, it makes it harder to fire people. And the fact that, you know, like these guys and their fans, right? I mean, all claim to be, you know, right? They're right wing culture warriors. They all they all they all claim to be free speech people. And it's like, well, no, I mean if you uh, if you actually cared about free speech, I mean we live in, you know, I mean, a profoundly inegalitarian and mediocre uh, democracy, but it's enough of a democracy that nobody is worried that they're going to like go to jail if they say the wrong thing, right? You know, right. Like, what are people re- realistically worried about? You know, most people uh, that they're going to get fired for their jobs. You know, if you if you actually cared about you know if you actually cared about free speech and you know and and uh, you know nonconformity and all that stuff, then like you'd you would be wildly in favor of uh, of labor unions, and that's the main point that I came to the debate wanting to make. And so, in a strange sort of way, I'm almost grateful that the um, that the bizarre antics backstage actually had the effect of focusing the debate on that main point. Yeah, it's actually a really interesting argument that I've never thought of myself, uh, or actually even heard before, as a response to uh, someone on the right wing. Uh, going after free speech that obviously they're going to also be against unions. But um, one of the things, you know, that I think that this debate shows is that uh, there is things you could do with people who are not willing to play fair or play Mm. by the usual rules of logic. And as someone who's known uh, as the logic guy on the left, uh, I think that's, pretty important to focus on because right now with the overturning of Roe versus Wade, I think a lot of the opposition to us are people who basically are religious Mm -hmm. uh, and they're not arguing in the framework of logic. And uh, it is going to require a different kind of response that uh, I'd like to hear your your opinion on because mm, mm-hmm. I've seen an explosion of pro-choice argumentation come out sure. in response to this, but seems to kind of miss the point that you're arguing with someone very religious on the other end. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. I mean, I think that um, I mean, I I guess I would say that pro-choice arguments could play a couple different roles right they can be um that one you could just be trying to get clear on you know on what you think right you know like like you know with with any argument right? I mean, like this is uh why is this so important to us and then uh and then another is that you're you're trying to convince um try to convince other people but then you know the question i would i would always raise is like okay but like who specifically right are you are you trying to convince right so if you're trying to to convince people who are like hardcore like evangelical christian or right-wing catholic um anti-abortion people well that's gonna be that's a that's an uphill battle right i mean that's that's like you're that's gonna your work is cut out for you there but I think that you could. Uh, there are a lot of people who uh, there are a lot of people who might not be that right, but who, but who might also be like not totally on your team. Who are you know might be like people who sort of in a day to day culture war sense the people who they most who most annoy them are liberals, right? You know, and right. um, and you know, and they might be. You know, and they might be like somewhat uncomfortable with abortion. I think that's where a lot of people that's where a lot of people fall, right? You know, that these you know, obviously again, the the really hardcore like right wing religious people that you're talking about uh are, you know, uh 
you know, who, who think it's, you know, who are just very clear in their minds that abortion is murder and it needs to be, needs to be illegal and all that stuff. You know, those people, I mean, the good news is that they, that is a minority, right? I mean, like that's, that's, that's definitely a minority. Uh, the, but there are a lot of other people who are like, look, they might be kind of squeamish thinking about abortion. You know, they don't, they don't like it. They, they have, uh, they have some level of discomfort with the idea. Do they exactly think, right? You know what the uh, what the people protesting outside Planned Parenthood think? Maybe not, right? You right. Know, but they're also not on our side about it. And I think those people, you know, I think there might be a more uh, a more target rich environment. I mean, as far as like what you say to the, uh, and you know, and I actually find like even with those people, just just at a really basic level. I mean, like you can kind of approach it, you know, like the same way. Uh, you know, to connect the subjects, right? The same way that like a union organizer, you know, will like spend most of their time listening, right? To to the workers' complaints and trying to, you know, and then like, you know, a little bit of time talking and try to say, okay, here's how, you know, here's how the union can help you, right? I think a little bit of that same mindset, maybe, right? I mean, if you if you just kind of like listen carefully to people and and ask the occasional targeted question, my experience at least is that sometimes people who are like you know uncomfortable with abortion they don't like abortion right you know they they might not be totally sure what they think the law you know like whatever like they um uh, oftentimes when you ask really simple follow-up questions like okay but like what exactly do you want to do right i mean do you want to do you want to put people in prison right and yeah i think you know a good thing of yours to watch for an example of how to do that would be when you were having a debate with uh charlie kirk mm-hmm. and you you did exactly what you just said. You spent a lot of time listening and then it came to the, well, what do you do about it part? Yeah. I mean, I think that they, so yeah, I'm trying to remember if, uh, if any abortion stuff came up there, but yeah, I know what you're saying. I think that the, um, I think that, I think that could be useful, you know, with a broad range of people. And I also think that there's, I also think it's useful to have maybe a multi-pronged kind of approach, right? In other words, I think that it's good to have like, look, here's my like really worked out argument about abortion rights, which gets me clear in my head on what I think. It uh, it maybe shores up wavering people who would you know who basically agree with me, and. If I need it in a argument with with somebody who who disagrees with me, I've got it right. I mean, if somebody if somebody wants like the long form, like really well worked out argument, I can give it to them, right? But then I could also just be like, okay, I can sort of push that point, right? You know, what do you want to do about it exactly? Uh, because I I find a lot of people. I mean, even the mainstream anti-abortion movement. Um, has this really weird, awkward position on this because if you remember from the 2016 election, Donald Trump at one point was asked about this. And he was like, oh, I don't know, I guess there should be some punishment for women who want abortions. And then all these people were like, <laughs> we're like, no, 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 Donald, don't say that, right? You can't say that. And I felt I almost felt sorry for him because it's like, look, Donald Trump does not actually give a shit about abortion one way or the other. I'm sure he's paid for several in his life. He has no, um, you know, he's, he doesn't he doesn't have the slightest moral objection to it. He just doesn't care about it one way or the other. Right. But I could understand how he could naively assume, like, yeah, I mean, of course, if you really believe that it's murder. Right then, of course. I mean, if somebody, if if somebody hired a hitman to to like have her children killed, then of course we would like put her in prison for the rest of her life, or if it's death penalty, the state would execute her. Right? I mean, that that's uh, that that sh- that would just like follow from the logic of the position. So what? So yeah, this is what you people want to hear, right? You know that there should be a punishment. Why don't you want to hear it? But like, I think even a lot of mainstream anti-abortion people, they know how unpopular that is. So, so they just want to imprison, you know, the doctor, um, which you know is bad enough, right? But I mean, it also doesn't make sense on its own terms. I think you can, I think you can kind of press that, and um, and I think that. 
I think that you can, I think the part that's touchiest on the left, but I think that is maybe something that should be part of the discussion is look, if you think that abortion is really murder, then you should want to, you know, you should want to like imprison women who have abortions. Um, if you don't quite think that, like once we really get into this, it turns out you don't quite think that. But, you know, you're not crazy about abortion. You want there to be less abortion or whatever. It's like, okay. Yeah. So something that comes out of everything we've just said is that there's this really big gap for a lot of people between their values and how you put those values into practice with legislation or otherwise. And uh, I don't know if you're used to talking to an anarchist audience, sure. but my sure. big shtick is, you know, that this is an anarchist show. So yeah. one of the things that's awkward about being an anarchist is there's not a lot that you could mm -hmm. uh, practice as far as policies go as an anarchist. However, I take a weird position on that where I do think there are some interesting policies that, that are uh, very much in line with anarchist values um, that Bernie Sanders proposed. One mm -hmm. is about employee ownership and allowing uh, banks to help workers buy their workplaces that are about mm -hmm. to uh, sell them. And the other is creating a, uh, a bank that would be to invest in, in new co-ops and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, anyway, so I think it's interesting to, to be able to say, you know, you could have anarchist values or you could have religious values or, yeah. you know, anti-abortion values, but there's a different realm uh, that you also have to know how to play in, which is the realm of uh, the way power works in the world we live in. Right. And what I wanted to ask you about that yeah. is, do you think that, um, so you, you consider yourself a democratic socialist or a social mm -hmm. democrat, which as far as values go is very similar to a libertarian socialist, mm -hmm. uh, except for a few key things but um uh when it comes to being practical it seems like uh obviously the dsa and democratic socialists have really taken the lead uh in the past i'd say 10 years compared to where anarchists were before that and i just i would like to hear some i don't know i guess some of your thoughts and about anarchism sure. and some of the reasons you don't particularly ascribe to it and yeah. Okay, sure. Uh, so, yeah, I, I guess one distinction to make right off the gate is between the, those two phrases that you just used, social democrat and, and democratic socialist. Uh, and, you know, I mean, if we're just, I mean, there's a certain sense in which, like, you know, I, uh, historically those and a bunch of other labels are all fine, right? I mean, like those, those are those have all been used by people who I basically agree with at one point or another historically. But uh, just so you know, poor person language is communication, and I don't want anybody to get the wrong idea, right? So I have a so uh, social democrat, even though it's actually like a perfectly good euphemism for uh, for democratic socialism, so you're you know spreading democracy into the social sphere, right? I mean, that's the original. Yeah that's the original meaning of social Democrat. But I, I should just say that one thing I think a lot of people hear when they hear social Democrat is because one thing that that phrase is often used to mean, right? We talk about social democracy as sort of a, uh, we kind of use it as a, sometimes as like a synonym for a kind of like, the sort of more expansive, more universalist kind of welfare state that uh, that is advocated, you know, by many socialist people and socialist parties, you know, which is certainly something I do advocate, right? I mean, I was like, right. like I was, I was going to say on the, you know, on the abortion subject, anybody who just wants less abortions, I would say that the combination of um, of lots of good sex ed and um, 
uh, very available contraception and, uh, and generous financial support for young parents, which were all things that I would support in principle anyway, because they give people more meaningful choices, uh, are, um, uh, are all things that actually make abortion less common. Uh, so if that is a goal of yours, right. I mean, that's something I would point out to people that, you know, that those, that's actually, those are all nice ways of, of serving that goal without putting anybody in jail. But, um, but I don't. So I do support social democracy in that sense. But I don't want to stop at social democracy. Right? I, I, yeah, I didn't even realize I said that. But <laughs> go yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. So, so I would. You know, I think that. Um, you know, I mean, I support you know reforms to you know the existing system and the interests of the working class. But I also support you know. I also would have a long-term political horizon that goes beyond the existing system. You know, I'd, and and definitely, definitely. Uh, overlaps with some of you know some of what you were sort of getting at earlier when you were talking about uh, worker ownership and and all of that, right? I mean, I think that um, we could have. Um, I remember this is something, you know, something I said, some version of I think in the debate with Charlie Kirk that you mentioned earlier. You know, I think that you know, look, all else being equal, uh, if somebody could figure out a good way to have like you know, economic planning in a totally marketless way by supercomputers or something, uh, then, um, that I'm for that. Right. You know, that sounds good to me. Uh, but, uh, until then, well, you know, I, I think that we sort of showed empirically from successful social democratic experiments in different countries that you can have at least some sectors, of the economy be nationalized without that leading to economic disaster, healthcare, for example. Uh, and, if we do, do do still need a market sector, you know that can at least be a market sector that looks less like Walmart and more like Mondragon, right? You know that uh, you know worker um, worker owned cooperatives that are internally democratic. So that would be my you know vision of a desirable future. As far as why I wouldn't think of myself as an anarchist, um, well, I mean, it's a little bit complicated because. Sometimes I'm not sure what people mean in two senses, right? When they say they're anarchists, one sure. is what is that the long term vision seems a little vague to me. But then the the second is, well, look, I like Noam Chomsky says he's an anarchist. It's like, well, what does that mean, right? You know, like if if you because if you if you basically support like doing a Social stuff using the state in in the you know short term, but then like in, in you know then in the very long term, right? You want there to not be a state anymore. That would just be like Orthodox Marxism, right? I mean, like that says. Uh, so I don't, I don't, I don't totally understand the, the, what distinctions people have, have in mind always. But like, uh, I guess I would just say, you know, just so I'm answer the question as directly as I possibly can, right? Why I wouldn't, uh, why I wouldn't call myself an anarchist or think of myself as an anarchist. I'm not even sure that I'm an orthodox enough Marxist to think that the state could ever completely wither away. Right. I think that we probably all always need, um, some social institutions that, you know, of the kind that it feels tempting to call a state. Right. So in other words, like, um, like just to be re- great about this um i could you know let's say it's like the 23rd century and poverty is a distant memory we have those uh you know we've got those like supercomputers that could do really efficient economic planning you know and uh all that yeah. stuff right you know so right. if we're living in that society i could believe that we'd have like the overwhelming majority of uh of crime of the kind that exists now wouldn't exist i could buy that right but are we going to have a reduction to zero even in that society of interpersonal violence i'm not sure i buy that and if we don't have a reduction to zero of interpersonal violence then i have a lot of questions that actually go back to the first thing we talked about about due process and all that stuff about how that's being handled right you know like like i would i would like uh you know i i'm not a fan of the death penalty which means that i think that if uh you know you probably need some sort of 
you know, involuntary confinement, you know, you, uh, and, uh, and I would hope that instead of just sort of being carried out by, you know, vigilantes, right. You know, that we have like something like a court system where we have protections for the rights of, of defendants and, uh, and, you know, before you know it, this starts to sound pretty statey, right. That would be my concern even about the yeah. long-term vision. So I, that makes a lot of sense to me why you would be skeptical in those areas. And one of the main reasons is anarchists actually don't uh, have a very clear response, especially when it comes to um, juris, you know, jurisprudence and things like that. Oddly enough, um, Bob Black, who mm-hmm. you might have heard of, uh, has some of the best responses to that. He, having been a lawyer... Uh, is pretty familiar with all that. Uh, and usually when you get anarchists to talk about it, they'll say something like, well, we believe in restorative justice, not mm-hmm. ret- retributive justice and mm-hmm. things like that. I think one of the main, well, I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually sympathetic to that, but they have a, yeah, uh, yeah. But like, you know, but I, I think, you know, but also um, if, also, again, what what exactly we're we talking about? In other words, that you you could have like that a that a sort of uh, less harsh and you know a sort of more compassionate and and humanitarian and and uh, rehabilitation oriented criminal justice system uh, than the one we've got. You know that that it might you know have like have something to do with you know like that they sort of guiding principles of it might look more like what people are talking about when they talk about restorative justice. That seems reasonable to me, but like also um, that doesn't seem like um, I don't know that I want to live in a society where, uh, you know, if somebody is like raped, for example, then the, uh, then like, well, maybe the rapist will agree to be in a restorative circle to like talk it out. Right. You know, that like, that's the, oh. You know, like, like, I mean, what's the, you know, Oh, what I, is like that ultimate, uh, I, 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 I mean, you can have restorative justice, like informing your system, but I, I would hope that the system also has like greater protection for personal safety against, uh, against violence than that. And I, maybe this is a limit of my imagination, but I have a hard time seeing what that looks like, you know, without, um, you know, without, um, you know, without some sort of. You know, I mean, it doesn't, you don't have to conceive of it. You don't have to conceptualize as justice as retributive punishment. Right. But like, you know, I do also think that in some circumstances, people should be removed from the rest of society for some period of time. And, uh, and then like, again, I have a lot of questions about who gets to, you know, like who makes those decisions, how it's enforced. Uh, and, and I would, I would, generally be much more friendly to the idea of of having those decisions be made you know uh within some collective democratic framework where you have um you know it's it's not you know that you've you've ultimately got some sort of uh whatever enforcement happens there's got to be some right you know then that's that I, i i don't want that to just sort of be like you know community volunteers you know sort of like vigilantes right you know like 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 I'd, I'd like that to be some sort of accountable public institution yeah yeah same i mean same here and uh you know that might be a particularity of me and not common among anarchists but um i mean maybe there are good I, I don't know what i don't know what bob black says about this maybe there are good answers to this somewhere but i i don't uh i mean i mean just sort of like just sort of saying the words restorative justice like right oh and i don't even know if he his big critique, he actually goes to the foundations of law in natural rights and things like that, yeah. and gets into those debates. But um, it's more so the point I was making is just anarchists haven't generally worked out a lot of detailed uh, answers yeah. to that question. Mostly okay. it seems like what the the main issue or the main difference between someone who yeah. would be like Bookchin yeah. who's into libertarian mun- municipalism uh-huh. And someone like Bernie Sanders, who the two of them have had uh-huh. conversation in the past, is on the question of taxes. Yeah. And, okay. And um, who who gets to tax who? I guess to fund 
various institutions, whether they're concerned with um, peacekeeping or defense or social services and so on and so forth. So what's, so what's, what's, uh, I mean, I know a little bit about Murray Bookchin, but what's his answer to that question? Who gets, you know, like, like that, I mean, I assume that, I mean, given the way you set it up, right. And like, I, I assume the Bookchin is against at the very least thinks that like legitimate taxation would only be like what local or. Yeah, pretty much. I think his, uh, you know, his mate, he started off as a very strong Marxist then became an anarchist yeah. and then even said he was no longer an anarchist and referred to himself as a libertarian municipalist. So basically he thinks the municipal level is as big as the, uh, the largest institution that could be justified as having some sort of like representation of the people it claims to. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm just super suspicious of, of localism in general for a few reasons. Like what is that, uh, I think, uh, well, I mean, look, think about the, uh, the Supreme court overturning Roe v. Wade, right. And, uh, and, and sending, you know, abortion to the States, right. Is that a good thing? I don't think so. I, 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 I think it would be a great thing if it were federally codified, right. You know, by, by Congress, uh, because, you know, I, I think the effect, and I think it's a telling example, right. For the same reason, like the civil rights movement is a telling example that like oftentimes like local, the devolution of power to localities like actually makes it harder for democratic majorities to do what they want and sort of, and sort of allows like kind of local regimes of power to sort of treat people within a locality as their little, you know, spider in their little jar. Yeah. And, and that's, uh, someone even just a few days ago, like responded to something I said on Twitter and said, wait, you're against Roe v. Wade. That that's a decentralization of power. You should be for that. And, uh, no, I'm, <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's all, it's all in context for me, but then the, you know, if you get someone who's really into Prudhomme, yeah. uh, they would say that the federal principle is, uh, where that, role comes in where you'd have different anarchist communes or maybe towns would be a better word for it that would confederate together. And then that's how you would exercise some sort of uh, management of that problem of like, you know, the, the white supremacist group that wants to have their own little uh, white world or, I don't know. I mean, a confederation of, uh, of, of local communes, uh, I mean, for one thing, like, uh, if it's, I mean, the whole, everything about that language makes it sound like you can secede if you don't like the, uh, the, uh, the federation. Uh, yeah. so yes. that's, so that sounds like, you know, so that sounds like the, um, that sounds like the white supremacist communes probably in the clear. Uh, and, I'd also want to know, like, okay, is this like at least centralized? I'm going to go back to the judicial questions, right? Is this at least se- is this centralized enough that, like, if everybody, if I'm accused of a crime and everybody in my commune thinks I did it, that I can, like, I, I, I have some sort of mechanism to appeal for a change of venue? I mean, I hope so. Uh, and like, I also, I'd also point out, right, that the that decentralization. I mean, if you look at, um, not that it's you know, uh, I think either of our preferred model in many ways, right? I mean, there, there are many, many things wrong with this society, but like, if you look at like, uh, Tinoist Yugoslavia and, you know, the source of a lot of political tensions there, uh, that, that helped to undermine and ultimately bring down that system. You know, I think that, I think you can see it a lot of it had to do with material equality between different regions. Um, because it was very, very decentralized in, in certain respects. And I, I don't know. I mean, like I think about like uh, if we have, if we had like a, a really decentralized version of socialism in, uh, in the United States. Right. I mean, which, which would you rather be in, right? The, um, uh, the California commune or the Appalachia commune. Yeah, it's a really good question, especially since our whole entire system is based on that question, uh, at least since the Civil War, right? You know, obviously, the issue of slavery was a huge part of that. But the I, go- mean, I mean, it just, know, the- just seems like if you want to have a more egalitarian society, obviously, the, 
the most important thing is ending is ending class based inequality. But like you have a but you you would have a hell of a lot of regional redistribution to do after that. Yeah, and but then on the other side, there's the problem of nationalism and okay. a, a state structure that's founded upon a myth of national identity, which uh -huh. in America isn't quite as much of a question as it is in Europe. But I mean, the 20th century was full of Europeans getting fed up with uh, with liberal democracy and saying we need to go back to some sort of more rooted nationalist uh, system that is founded on God or primordial blood or whatever. Sure. I mean, you don't have to convince me that nationalism is bad, but even there I'd question whether uh, the, the historical record bears out decentralization as a, as a good thing. Right. I mean, like if you look at the, um, you know, I mean, there are, there are a million good objections to the EU and the version that it exists. But I think as a, uh, as a, but I think that like having that kind of supranational structure uh, has actually had some good results, you know, in, in terms of, um, you know, in, in terms of bringing about better human rights protections and, uh, and, and sort of, again, taking people out of being the spiders in particular national jars. And, you know, if you look, I mean, if, you know, I mean, again, if you look at uh, like Brexit as an experiment in decentralization, right? You know, it's it's not it's not good, right? And I mean, that's a, and that's and that's actually a pretty relevant example. I mean, if you're talking about the United States, um, you know, if you're talking about the United States sort of uh, becoming, you know, this uh, much less centralized uh, patchwork of, of lower level entities. Right. I mean, then it's like, yeah, you know, the UK is about the right size for one of those, you know, for one of those entities. Uh, and, yep. and I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think that like, I think that I've, oftentimes it seems like, um, you know, it seems like, you know, I mean, my, you know, my mother's family is, is from, well, what's now the former Yugoslavia. And, uh, and I think about the, uh, that that you know that place and and its uh, its ex experience of uh, of of decentralization, right? I mean, having this having this sort of um, you know multi uh, you know multi ethnic nation seems to be you know a good thing, and then having and then having this sort of breakdown into you know I mean, in fact, oftentimes I mean the sort of like really savage nationalism is that this like absurdly hyper local level where you have where it's like you know it would be impossible to explain to an outsider like what the differences are between the groups right and i actually i fall on the same you know side as you do about uh multiculturalism and the national question versus uh just these really small ethnic communities that are waging a uh, constant battle against each other for resources and things like that. But um, I think, so maybe to turn on that question a little bit and look at uh, a different perspective, which would be the perspective of indigenous okay. yep. communities. Um, the question in my mind becomes, how do you figure out who assimilates to which system? Sure. Right. So in the United States, we have indigenous uh, uh, native. Um, what is it called? Uh, uh, sovereignty. Something yeah, sure. Yeah, that's yep, the yep. foundation for yep. um, their own legislation, and everything. So, yeah. which actually is coming up in the courts again, because they just uh, I don't know if they went through on it yet, but they're talking about getting rid of some of that sovereignty. So. Yeah, I, I I mean I would say like sure I mean that the I I guess I'd want to separate out a little bit the the sort of question of uh, you know historical wrongs from the question of of what we think you know a good system would uh, would look like you know because uh, I'm not you know like okay sure look compared to all of the million examples. Uh, most, you know, mostly in Europe of, of, um, of decentralization being a nationalist horror show, uh, that, right. uh, uh, 
you know, if you say, well, some native, you know, some native tribe uh, having more, um, you know, having more power, you know, sounds like a good thing, right? You know, because because you're talking about, you know, you're talking about entities composed of people who are, you know, the victims of all sorts of awful things historically, and are very poverty stricken, and you know, and sort of sort of any devolution of power to them sounds sounds good, and also it's the you know, you're talking about context of the United States and Canada where you're not actually particularly worried about like ethnic civil war started. Um, so that also colors the question. But then I, w- I would say even there though, right? I don't know. I mean, I think about stuff like, um, you know, I mean, I, I'm not going to be able to like name names specifically here. Cause it's, it's, it's not particularly something I came, you know, I came prepared on, but I mean, so I'm, I'm just, I'm just spitballing based on stuff that I read years and years and years ago. But like, I think that, you know, I know there are cases of uh, tribes that had like at various points in the past, they'd done things like, you know, taking in escaped slaves and, you know, you'd had people who were, uh, who were members for like generations and generations, but then like they're, start to precisely as you start to devolve uh devolve stuff to the tribe and there starts to be more financially at stake in uh in, in whether you're a member of this tribe or not like they 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 would get like super um like you know super like blood purity about it you know it's like no 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 no, no. you're not really a member of this tribe unless you know unless we could really like trace you know the, your um uh, you know, we could really trace all of your ancestors back to it, you know, long enough, right? And uh, and I think that that's the kind of thing that, like, when you do start to have more rights being attached uh, to like really particular local entities, I mean, like you're gonna you're gonna start to to get more of. So uh, so I don't, you know, I don't I don't claim to know, you know, exactly what the right you know uh, solution is there, and I and I would and I certainly hear you on on the kind of ugliness of forced assimilation, but I'd still say that uh, I, I'm still even there. I'm still very like distrustful of um, of like hyper particularist sort of super localist things where you you end up like you know I, I want. I think that it's. I think there's a real danger of um, moving away from like big collective entities where who you are in particular is um, is uh, is de-emphasized. I think it's good to de-emphasize who you are in particular, right? I mean, I, I want the like like any time I hear about a a possible world where you know you have you know it's just like some super decentralized you know group of of uh of local communes or something it's like i don't know i mean i i think there's some value to like having a society where you know if you want to get to know your neighbors and you and you want to like have to care about what their opinions are and all that stuff that's that's open to you Right, you know, but if you uh, if you don't particularly care to, that's also open to you. I mean, I I, I kind of think that it's <coughs> I'd, I'd be very concerned about the um, you know the people who like you know I I want people to be able to move around and like um, in a very like no fuss no muss way, right? Like something that like something that like even some you know modern european countries have had is like you 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 have to like um you know you have to like register with the police when you know you move to a new town and i hear that i think man you know it's like all right point to america right you know that you can you know you can just like move around and you're fine you know city state whatever you know it's, it's all fine all of your rights are you know transfer you know are 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 sort of immediately transferable. I mean, that's something that I even like about supranational entities like like the EU. As as much as you know, the EU we have is is sort of bound up with you know with with um, you know the sort of power of bankers and all that stuff in ways that can be terrible, right? You know, the the, the aspect of it that I like is that the uh, that like it even extends that. You know, beyond uh, beyond national borders, you know that that seems that seems very good to me. And like the the more sort of 
the more power you have vested in like some very local thing, right. You know, that you're a member of this tribe that, you know, you count as a member of because of like who your ancestors were, or you're a member of this, you know, you're a member of this particular local community because you live between here and here, you know, then, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I might take that world anyway as a trade if we got like workers control the means of production and all those nice things. But like, the, <laughs> right. uh, you know, but like that would be the aspect of it that would make me, you know, that that would make me look twice and hesitate. Yeah, I mean, well, that's a lot to chew on, and I def- I didn't come prepared to like <laughs> hash it all out or debate it right now or anything either. I yeah. was. Uh, I mean, this is there are some of the biggest questions in the his, history of socialism and sure. even the history of philosophy when it comes to the particular and the universal, or if you want to make it an abstract question. Um, so, just uh, last quick sum sure. up: um, left unity, good, bad, and the <laughs> ugly. Oh, <laughs> uh, depends. I think that. I think that, like, on the one hand, uh, there are certainly kinds of left disunity that are pathological that, like, people um, end up, like, being very concerned about things that are not necessarily things that have to... um, preoccupy, like, that that are, like really that relevant to politics as they're as as they're experienced in the real world right so like if you and i uh were unable to um uh you know we're we're unable to to work together on the surely vast majority of things we agree about because we have a different you know, we have different instincts about how socialism should look in the 23rd century, whether it should be super decentralized or whatever, then like that, that seems silly. Right. So that's certainly true. Uh, on the other hand, I also think that like the left unity can be fetishized in a way that's also kind of pointless because, um, I don't actually, it can lead people to spend it all of their time sort of like trying to like figure out how you're going to like work it out with like people who um, ultimately they're like 10 of them. Right. Like, and, <laughs> yeah. and so it's like, I don't, you know, I mean like the, this is especially like this, why, like, I don't know. I don't really like, I'm prepared to be like somewhat contemptuous of, you know, leftists who, think that like North Korea isn't that bad or whatever, because not just like for the sort of general human reasons that anybody might be prepared to be contemptuous of that, but also because like as a political calculation, uh, I think we need the tens of millions of normies who, uh, uh, who would, um, uh, who would be alienated by that far more than we need the 10 people who on the left who think the North Korea isn't that bad in that example. So, I mean, I think that the, and I think the point somewhat generalizes, in other words, like, look, should you be more focused on things that are happening immediately in the time and place that you're living than on very abstract disagreements about what you might hope, what outcome you root for in the distant future or what side of some faction fight you hypothetically would have been on in the 1920s or whatever. Yes, for sure. Right. And there is a certain way of spitting that answer that's very pro left unity. But also, like, don't lose too much sleep thinking about left unity because, like, whether or not you're united with other people in this tiny minority of society should really be <laughs> pretty far down your, your list of priorities. Right. I mean, what you should actually be worried about is how you're going to go about, you know, winning over large numbers of people who've never heard of any of this stuff. <laughs> All right. Well, I definitely agree with that. And uh, I'm always harping on anarchists that they should have a more outward facing uh, approach to things. And by that, I mean, outward from people who are ultra political like me or you or Mm -hmm. all that. So I really appreciate you having uh, coming on the show. Is there anything you want to uh, drop on the audience, let them know about that you're going to be working on? Oh, is there anything I want to drop on the audience? Not really. I think that I I would just say so. 
Yeah, watch, uh, give them an argument. Main show is on uh, Monday night at 8 uh, and um, on YouTube. Then it goes out as a podcast later. And there are also uh, debate breakdowns at 8 o'clock. These are all Eastern time on Thursday night. So check that out. Awesome. And I'll put a bunch of links in the description as well. All right. All right. Thanks for coming on, Ben. All right. Thanks, Jared. This was fun.